Hey everybody, thank you for downloading episode 144 of We Got This with Mark and Hal. In case you weren't already aware, we have a live show coming up in January. It's a little ways away, but it's not too early to get your tickets. We're going to be doing a show on Sunday, January 14th as part of San Francisco Sketchfest with our friends Craigslist. Another awesome podcast with your hosts, Craig Kukowski and Carla Kukowski. We're doing a double bill. Our guests will be Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher. Their guests will be none other than Busy Phillips. It's going to be an amazing show. You can get tickets right now. Go to sfsketchfest.com. Go to the ticket link. We're going to be on Sunday, January 14th. And for now, if you want to do something to support the show, we'd really appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts. The ratings are great, but we need those reviews. That's how new people find the show. And also, once we hit a magic number of reviews, and we're still a ways away, but I think we can get there pretty quickly. We'll be able to get some more merch in the store. We have a great poster available right now, but there's so much more that we could offer to you, and we need those reviews to do it. So go to Apple Podcasts, give us a glowing sterling review, tell us what you love about the show. For now, enjoy this episode of We Got This with Mark and Hal. Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle, once and for all, the Flintstones or the Jetsons. That's right. Don't worry, everyone. We got this. Podcasts should have a theme song. Podcasts should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Oh, Hal. What is it, Mark? You know, I love cartoons, and I want to talk about cartoons. Yep. It's just, I don't think you and I are quite experts the way we should be about cartoons, and I don't think that we could talk as intelligently as our audience deserves. Now, Mark Gagliardi. What? Marcus James Gagliardi. Not my name. We both grew up watching tons of cartoons. Sure. We both do voiceover work now. Yeah. But we are by no means experts in the way that our guest is an expert. Wait, what? Yeah. We're, we're in somebody's house. Oh, wait. That's what this is. That's when I take a bag off of your head, you're usually in somebody else's house. Afterwards. Oh, man. Or I'm in a uh, storage crate on a ship bound for Shanghai. Yeah. And that is a house for a rat. Our guest today <laughs> uh, is a legend, uh, legendary writer in comics and uh, in animation. Uh, he is uh, – you may know him if you listen to our bonus episode from our, our best cartoon cat, uh, which was called – the bonus episode called Talking Garfield with Mark Evanier. It's Mark Evanier. Welcome, sir. Wow. How did you guys get in my house and why did you have a bag on his head when he came in? <laughs> well, let me take the bag off of yours and I'll explain. Right. <laughs> uh, no, no. I was doing my Murray Langston impression. Oh, there All you right. go. All right. <laughs> a, thank you for letting us uh, quickly bum rush you in another episode. All and right. B, thank you for agreeing to join us in your own full episode of the show. I, I have very little shame and low standards, so it's fine. It's so oh, good. <laughs> That's the intersection of our show. Uh, now, you've worked all over in animation, uh, but you've done your fair share of Hanna-Barbera work. Can you just give for for our listening audience a bit of your CV, and then I have a very specific uh, question about uh, a one piece of work and a character you created. So leave that off, and then we'll okay, talk about it. Okay, I didn't it. create him, but I, I know what you mean, but I did yep. not create him. I, okay. just, I just kind of introduced him into the world. Fair enough. Um, uh, my first Hanna-Barbera show was Richie Rich. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't, I started an animation actually working for Ruby Spears Productions, which at that time was a rival that was taking work away from Hanna-Barbera. And that's why they got bought by Hanna-Barbera. Mm-hmm. If you can't beat them, buy them. And, uh. It's the American way. Yeah. And I got, uh, started working on Richie Rich, which I wound up eventually story editing for a couple of years. I did for Hanna-Barbera, so I did some Scooby-Doo's. I did, um, a Yogi Bear primetime special. I did, I did the show called The Trollkins, which nobody remembers. Um, <laughs> I did uh, a bunch of, I did, actually, my very first thing I ever did for Hanna Barbera was a live action pilot, um, for a situation comedy, um, that they, f- after I was working for Hanna Barbera running their comic book department. Okay. And I kept trying, thought, you know, maybe I can get them to let me, write some cartoons because the Scooby-Doo TV show 
was lifting plots from the Scooby-Doo comic books I'd written. And I couldn't somehow make that transition. I couldn't connect with anybody who had the power to get me from the comic books to the shows. And then one day my agent for my TV writing uh, sold me and another writer I was working with at the time to uh, Hanna-Barbera's live action department. And I, I said, gee, I really want to write I'd much rather write a cartoon for them. I, I, I grew up on Hanna-Barbera cartoons. I see Mr. Barbera in the halls all the time. I've never met him yet. Um, I'd love to work on the cartoons. Why would I want to – I would rather do a cartoon than this live action show. So yeah. I, I so I, I, I wrote this pilot that was just a disaster. It was – we all have – those shows that we, you know, I have the I have the disadvantage of having a unique name. I can't say well some other Mark the other Mark Evanier wrote that one. Right. I, I envy you know guys who are named you know Fred Smith. I they can always claim it was the other Fred Smith. So there's a lot of Alan Smithies that have been writing yes. things for years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the problem was that since I first met Joe Barbera writing this show. He thought I was a live action writer and Joe was going through this phase of, well, you know, live action writers can't write animation. They'd go back and forth on this at different times at Hanna-Barbera. They would, at point, sometimes they'd say, you know, well, we need to have guys who understand cartoons and, and maybe, you know, have, have a better visual sense. So that's not live action guys. And then all of a sudden the networks would say, you know, why don't you get writers like those prime time guys? And suddenly they go, okay, let's hire prime time writers and, and, you know, the batting average was about the same either way. Mm -hmm. Some of the guys were good and some of them weren't. Um, so, but I was unfortunately, this is a period when they, when they, being a live action writer was the surest way not to get work in cartoons. <laughs> so wow. I got hired by Ruby Spears first. And then one day I did so many shows for Ruby Spears that Joe Barbera phoned me and said, why didn't you tell me you can write cartoons? And I said, I only told you 343 <laughs> times. It seems like you got into actually writing cartoons for television the way that someone whose watch says 544 and they need to set it for 548, so they do it counterclockwise. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. I had thought, see, I, my plan was to go from writing comic books to writing TV shows based on comic books like, like Hanna-Barbera cartoon mm -hmm. shows and then segue to live action. And I did it backwards. I did... I did the comic books first, and then I started writing live action shows. And I was writing sitcoms and primetime shows, and and some um, pretty epic, legendary shows. Well, you have uh, you've created or no, been a part I, of. I didn't or... create very many TV. I didn't create a lot of TV stuff. The, I just I got hired on like Welcome Back, Cotter, and I got hired on Love Boat and a bunch of shows. I had a partner, and we and he was a much better seller of our talents than I could have been on my own. And um, he's the one who actually got us the job writing the. Uh, the live action, uh, the first live action show we did. Actually, we did two live action shows for Hanna-Barbera. We did another thing before the beach show. Uh, I forgot that one. Uh, so I, every time I met Joe Barbera, I thought I was a live action writer. I wrote, I wrote, uh, I think the first thing I wrote for Hanna-Barbera, I wrote a, one or two Richie Riches, and then I wrote, you're going to ask me about Sc Scrappy Doo. Yeah, let's talk about Scrappy Doo. Yeah. You're, now you're, you did not create did Scrappy not Doo. Create let's Scrappy set the record straight right now. No, I did not create Scrappy Doo. I wrote the pilot that introduced him. I wrote the episode that introduced him. And, uh, what happened was that, uh, you know, you go through, in this business, you go through periods when the, the network likes you. You also go to the mm -hmm. prison where the network says, don't get that guy, don't hire him. I was in a period when the people at ABC in, in Saturday morning liked me, and I'd written a lot of things for them. I wrote a lot of the ABC weekend specials. I wrote some pilots. I wrote some, uh, I, they, they were, I was one of their favorite writers for about 12 minutes. And, uh, they were going to cancel Scooby Doo. It had been on for 800 years, and <laughs> it was getting very stale. And at this point in the existence of, of Sco the Scooby-Doo show, here was how you sold the script for Scooby-Doo. You'd go to the producer or the story editor and you'd say, um, how about a fake ghost that looks like a uh, uh, ping pong champion who's haunting the <laughs> ping pong tournament? <laughs> and, and the, and the, the – Story editor producer would haul out this list of all the episodes they'd done and go, ping pong tournament, ping pong tournament. <laughs> we did it in season three and we did it in season five and I've got one in development now. But if you come up, could come up with an idea that hadn't been done, you had a sale. Everything else they could figure out. I mean, if you, if you had a unique premise for here's the ghost, here's why it's fake, here's why someone's pulling the hoax, 
Everything else could fall, could, could be configured. And the show had gotten so stale that CB, the ABC rather, had decided to drop it and pick up a show from Ruby Spears, the pilot for which I'd written for Ruby Spears. And then <laughs> Joe Barbera phones me and he says, I need you to write this pilot for Scrappy Doo. So, you know, I grew up on Hanna Barbera cartoons. There's some things I'm really good at, but saying no to Joe Barbera was not one of them. <laughs> and he calls me in and he shows me these sketches for Scrappy. They've got, they've got, and they've written 15 scripts, different staff writers. I was not a staff writer at the time. I was just a freelancer. But staff guys had all written these outlines and scripts and plots and everything. Some whole scripts and they never didn't like any of them. And they weren't going to pick up Scooby Doo for another season without some new element in it. Mm-hmm. And they weren't going to buy the show with Scrappy Do It until they had a script that they thought really worked and showed the character off how he functions. And I was charged with writing that script. And so I figured out how he functioned and I wrote the script and they bought it, which displeased Joe Ruby over Ruby Spears because the show I was doing for him didn't sell. They picked up Scooby Doo instead. Yeah. But that's what happens occasionally. And Were you was now the the phrase Puppy Power. Yeah. The phrase Puppy Power was invented by a man named Frank Welker, who was the voice of Fred. Oh, sure. Oh, of course. And, I didn't realize and, and, that he... And he was the voice of Scrappy for about uh, one day. They kept changing who Scrappy's voice was. The, the, network, the network wasn't happy with the first one of voice. They replaced him. It was thorough. The second voice. A little too deep. No, yeah. no. Actually, <laughs> the very first one was going to be Don Messick. Mm-hmm. And they decided that that wasn't quite the right voice. So Frank Welker was picked and he had lived puppy power in his audition. And Joe Barbera, remembering how Alan Reed had once ad libbed Yabba Dabba Do, said, Oh, this is the same gold. I didn't think it was quite the same gold, but, <laughs> and, uh, then they went through. Now, I don't, I can't give these in order exactly, but at one point, Marilyn Schreffler was the voice of Scooby Doo. At one point, Dawes Butler was the voice of Scooby Doo. Uh, excuse me, I'm talking about Scrappy now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marilyn Schreffler. At one point, it was going to be Paul Winchell. Uh, at one point, it was going to be, I, Forget all the people we went through. It was just like you, I'd go in every day and I'd say, who's the voice of Scrappy? Now? John Gielgud, huh? Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, man. You know. I would love the puppy <laughs> so, power. <laughs> so um, they finally settled. I, I suggest that at one point Dick Beals was going to be that. If you know who Dick Beals was, he was going to be the voice of, of Scrappy. And then they came – Then and they were so desperate, they came to me and asked me for my idea. Uh, one of the secrets of Hanna-Barbera, I will let you in on – was he was the best salesman you ever saw. If Joe Barbera had been a used car dealer, we'd all have a 10-year-old Chevy. I mean, we'd be everybody. <laughs> he could, this man could sell anything. And he was charming and funny and witty. Anyway, they, ABC bought the show. Uh, they, they picked up Scooby for another season with Scrappy as a new element. And Lenny Weinrib wound up being the voice of the character for the first season. And Lenny who was a wonderfully talented, funny man. He was the voice of H.R. Puff and stuff. And he mm-hmm. was the voice of lots of Hanna-Barbera characters at the time. And and one of those actors who just worked every minute of the day in front of a microphone. Lenny started was having some problems in his life at the time. He, he actually just quit the business after a couple of years later and moved to Chile um, out of nowhere. His agent He didn't have his, connections his, to his, Chile? He was no, like his, just through no, a dartboard and uh, started a map? No, what happened was he was um, – it's kind of complicated <laughs> – uh, we're getting way off the subject here, but that's okay. But, we'll, we'll eventually Len, talk Lenny, about Lenny's, uh, Lenny. Lenny's wife was from Chile. Oh, okay. okay. And she said, you know, he's, he was going through a lot of stress, and she said, you know, with your money, we could go to live on top of a mountain in a mansion with servants in Chile for the rest of your life. You know, we, you can buy a and a light bulb went you, off above his head. Yeah. If, you, if you sold your house over here in Hancock Park area, area mm-hmm. you could buy a house six times the size of it in Chile and have servants. And and Lenny said, "Let's do it." And he disappeared one day. He just his agent phoned me and said, "Have you heard from Lenny? I don't. I can't reach him." <laughs> Scrappy <laughs> Doo flew yeah. the yeah. coop to wow. Chile to live in a mansion. Yeah. That's but, where he's but, hiding well, out. That actually, is a scoop. Well, actually, one of the things that upset him was losing the role of Scrappy Doo. Uh, oh. He the second season. He had had a problem with uh, a man named Gordon Hunt was directing the voices in the show, and Gordon was a decent, lovely man. Just passed away about a year, less than a year ago. Great director, and it was one of the. If you had a fight with Gordon Hunt, you were in the wrong, just because he was so good at what he did <laughs> and so decent, such. And Lenny kept having fights with him, and when it 
and they, when the second season of, of Scooby with Scrappy came up, uh, Lenny said, I won't work with Gordon Hunt. And Gordon Hunt said, I won't work with Lenny. And they went to Lenny and said, well, who do you want to have direct the shows? And he said, how about Mark Evanier? And I said, and they came, Bill Hanna called me and said, would you like to direct the voices on Scooby-Doo? And I said, well, I don't want to step on Gordon Hunt's toes. And he said, oh, Gordon would like you to do it. I said, well, I want to hear that from him. So he said, be my guest. I went down to Gordon's office and I said, uh, how would you feel if I were to direct the Scooby-Doo shows? He says, please, please, I'll give you money. Please take, take it away from me. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so for about two days, I was going to direct it until, the, until someone at Hanna-Barbera Accounting realized that they would have to pay me and they couldn't deduct that money from Gordon Hunt's contract. Right. And they went, okay, let's replace Lenny instead. And, and Don Messick, the first choice, became Scrappy-Doo. Wow! Look at that you know, so well, uh, you you talked about about Joe Barbera being able to sell anything, yeah. And so today we're here to speak to you about maybe two of his most famous Before, sales of all time. It's your hold on now? a second. Now Mark, I'm going to do it. I have a couple of look. I, while we've got you here, we'll talk about. I just want to point out how crazy this is, <laughs> Mister Evan. I'm just going to call you Evanier. I'm going to call him Mark if that's all right with you, uh, Mister Evanier. Mister Evanier, yes. no. Captain Evanier. Yes. Uh, thank you for your service, but yes. I'm always the one who stops him from moving the show forward. <laughs> all right. I'm going to. I'm having the vapors right now. Yeah. I can't wait to hear what I you know. have to say. I just have two. I have because I know you are a legend in the cartoon no, world. No, and no, the, I'm not a legend. Everybody, to guys, every, to guys who work every, in the hold game, it, hold you're it. A everybody on every podcast is a legend. Have you ever heard a podcast where someone had a guest who didn't say we have a legend? Here? Oh yeah, we've yeah. had we've had some guests on our show who are simply our friends. Yeah, oh. my dad's been on like three times. <laughs> Believe me, your your legendary father, his my father, Bill Lublin. He's only legendary because he. There's gave, a, there, he, the, 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 I, I, I balk at this because I have friends who have become convinced they are legends because they've been told this so often by people trying to inflate the importance of the guests they have to make them you know, more important. No, you – listen. I was a huge Garfield fan. Just getting this, to talk to you for five minutes is huge. Heading. You oh. want to talk about Garfield? I wanted, well, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask for if you had any crazy Sid and Marty Croft stories. I have – Oh, I, yeah. I, I, give me six more podcasts. We can do that. I, <laughs> because I, every I, time I, I watch I, a Sid and Marty Croft them. show – it looks like they're having the most fun of any set of yes, any show yes. I've ever seen. Was, For our listeners who don't know, Sid and Marty Croft uh, created basically live action cartoons. Yeah. They're owned these whimsical, magical worlds on sound stages that all looked uh, somewhat similar to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory in the original motion picture. Um, can you tell us a little about a little bit about working at Sid and Marty oh, Croft? Oh, well, Sid and Marty Croft, I just saw uh, Sid and Marty at the Comic-Con. I haven't seen them for a couple of years and I ran into them. We hugged and everything and I just, I just was so great. They, they were great guys to work with. You, you did not work for Sid and Marty. You got it, you got adopted into the family. I love that. And, wow. and I worked for them on and off for, well, pretty much 10 years continuously and then a lot of other projects after that. And Marty said, Oh, I got a new project. Come on and see me. I got a new show for you to do. Um, they were great and they were, and, and there's, you want to, you can't apply the word legendary to someone like me when there's a Sid and Marty Croft in the world. And it's just, it, the, what are you going to say, say, how are you going to describe them in a way that, that doesn't bring them down to my level? <laughs> you know what? You're right. How okay. can we get Sid and Marty Croft in oh, here yeah, to let's do just this? ask Evan. They, yeah. they, um, they had this wonderful family of people and they, uh, uh, Sid, Croft is one of the most creative people in the world. He would come up with these ideas that no one else would have thought of. <laughs> and, yeah, we've seen and, the shows. And, <laughs> and, 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 and some of them, I mean, and Sid would be the first one to say this, some of them were stupid, ridiculous ideas. But if Sid came up with 10 ideas, someplace in there, there'd be one that nobody else in the world would ever have come up with. And Marty, he, he, Sid would walk in and this is not a real world example. He comes and says, what if we filled the entire stage with French vanilla ice cream? And Marty would say, do you know what that's going to cost? Do you have any idea what we're going to do? How, wait, wait a minute now. How about if it's just regular vanilla? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they just, they had this company that would make, they had a, Puppet Factory, and they had a comp and they and a division that essentially would build anything, uh, uh, props for other shows. You know, they built the Banana Splits costumes. That makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. They um, and they they would build things for Las Vegas shows. They would they would make sets and and art direct things 
uh, for the oddest things. Um, and uh, I worked for them uh, for a number of variety shows starring people who didn't speak English very well. <laughs> and I worked for them on uh, shows with puppets. I worked on uh, – I actually worked even worked puppets for them. Yeah, well, this was you, – you're, you're talking about the, the women from Japan. The, the pink lady. The uh, pink before lady. Before that, I did a show with the Bay City Rollers for them. And the, they spoke <laughs> – Yes. They spoke – They spoke – <laughs> amazing. They spoke English but not that much better. Um, they were lovely guys. They're uh, from Australia, yeah? They were from – they were Scotland. They were, Scotland. They Scotland. Scotland. Did they speak oh, English in Scotland? Yeah, but mm. they had these thick accents. What, what happened was we had this uh, – when we started meeting with – when the rollers came over – uh, and we had to meet with them. Uh, it was, and I can't do the accent. One of the runners used to tell the story about he would talk to these how, are you guys gonna look for doing the show, and then they'd say something in English, but with such a thick brogue you couldn't figure out what they were saying. It's <laughs> that accent that sounds like we assault the hell over the head. Yes, oh, right. So yeah. we brought in this wonderful dialogue coach, a man named Jonathan Lucas, who was like a Henry Higgins type. He was a guy who could teach anyone. And after three weeks, we couldn't understand Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> The rollers had not yeah. changed. At the they set, are the rollers, and, man. And, and at that point, the rollers group was kind of breaking up, and the guys were all suing each other. <laughs> so that didn't. So that's fine. Help with the discord. On top of that, uh, we stashed them away at a house in Laurel Canyon just to live. They were going to live. Some, Marty Croft owned an extra house somehow, and he put them there. It was a house he was trying to sell, but he put the rollers in there, and it was a secret where they were because at the studio. The gates were covered around with 15 year old girls dying to meet the rollers. And <laughs> when I would drive in to the lot each day, these women would come up to my car going, can you get us on the set? Can you get the, can you get Woody to sign my, my, my chest? Can you get whatever it was? And then when I left, they would start following me in case I was going to the rollers house. It was, it was literally like you said, hard day's night. I was, it was living that experience for a Unbelievable. while. Unbelievable. Wow. And the Laurel Canyon version of a well, hard day's night. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then they, and then they found the house. I'd go over to the rollers house <laughs> and there are these 14 or 15 year old girls who are creeping into the neighbor's yard to peek into the, oh, the yard where God. the rollers are. And it was a very, bizarre experience american teenagers love a scotsman well yeah, yeah yes and uh so so we had a but every show with the cross was was amazing yeah. that way because they knew everybody in show business and uh we, i did a show with them one time it was a, a bobby vinton primetime special which was a pilot and what happened was that the um they sold to cbs the idea of doing a variety show which would have the appeal of the movie grease Mm-hmm. Right. Which was very hot at the sure. time. And so we, it was basically a 50s theme variety show. And we got on it. Several of the cast members of the movie Grease were on it, including Eve Arden and um, um, uh, Susan Buckner, who played the Petty Simcox, the Super Mario president, and Stocker Channing and and so on. And then we got a lot of 50s stars. We had like um, uh, Fabian – and of course, Bobby Vinton was the star. And oh, and then we were gonna we we booked they booked Sid Caesar, who was of course in the movie Grease, and then oh, he yeah. canceled out on us. And at the last minute, they brought in Gail Gordon, who you know for, for a guy reared on sitcoms, mm-hmm. working with Eve Arden and Gail Gordon was amazing. <laughs> and Eve Arden had all these great stories about working with the Marx Brothers and at the circus. Wow! And, and Gail Gordon had all these great stories about sitcoms he'd done, and he even had some stories. About Desi Arnaz that did not involve hookers. Hey, you may, so I, that's good. <laughs> so they do exist. The yeah. Hollywood legend is true. Yes. So, <laughs> so I'm, you know, and it, it's it, it. What what's interesting is that you write stuff, and all of a sudden you're doing it. You you know you would write a sketch and they build the set. Um, when we were doing Pink Lady, I got punchy. I was working. 24-7, around the clock, I had no sleep, seven days a week, I was exhausted. I, I got so, I was just staggering into to work each day because it was so much work. And one day, I suddenly turned to the other writers. And, oh, they would come to me and they'd say, we need to build the sets for the next episode. Now, we have to start building them now. And I said, we don't know what the guest stars are next episode. And they'd say, too bad, tell us what sets to build anyway for the sketches. So I had to commission the, ske- the, the sets. And then we had to write 
bits that fit the sets. So would you just think of interesting locations? Yes. You'd go, yeah, oh, great, yeah. uh, an Old West saloon and yeah, a barbershop. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly how Doctor's it Doctor's office at right. a Roman yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. courtyard. Yeah. You know. um, and it's so, fun to have constraints yeah. like that. So I, I went into the other writer. I was the head writer. And I walked, I walked to the other writers one day and I said, you know, whatever we do, they build. Whatever we offer, I say they need. They, I said, we could get an elephant. You, would you guys like oh, an elephant? Man. So I called in, and they said, okay, what? I said, watch this. And I called in the associate producer, a guy named Pat, and I said, uh, Pat, for the show next week, we need an elephant. And he said, what kind of elephant? I said, big elephant, biggest one you could get. <laughs> what kind and he of goes elephant? out, he goes out, <laughs> and then he comes back a few minutes later, and he says, tusks. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, tusks are optional. And he said, okay, fine. So oh, he, man. he, he goes out, and he comes back in a little while later, he says, Okay, I uh, I got the, I got an elephant for us, but he the uh, his trainer wants to see a script, and I said, <laughs> Wait a minute, <laughs> who is this diva uh, we, elephant? We've got we've got Sid Caesar guesting next week. Sid didn't want to see a script. Why does the elephant have to? <laughs> see it? Well, it's not the elephant's trainer; it's his manager. And I said, Wait a minute. The elephant has a manager and a trainer. I don't even. Have, I don't even have a manager. You know what it is? The last elephant that guy had managed was in Cleopatra. That just yeah, just yes. torpedoed so, his career. So the other writers, you know, Pat went okay, and the other writers looked at me and they said, "Wow, you just ordered an elephant." <laughs> <laughs> And I said, "Yeah, I guess I did. We got to find a sketch for him." And we we stuck the elephant in the sketch, and at just the perfect moment, if I had indicated this, the elephant decided to unleash a lot of elephant defecation all over the set and it was that's it was perfectly timed I mean, the elephant had was a really a trooper <laughs> he knew the right moment to, to, to let it go but you know you're out on the set you're casting dancers and singers and we have guest stars coming in and they're making costumes and it felt like show business yeah, yeah. Show, that's one of those there's that like image of show business where it's a back lot and you see an elephant and a cowboy and three showgirls and an astronaut. You're like, yep. that's, and then two guys walking past with a backdrop painted like an exotic location. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. It was like that. Have I ever told you my Hollywood story where I knew I was in Hollywood? No. Uh, in 2000, I did extra work on Spider-Man on the first of uh, the Sony Spider-Man. The Maguire. Tobey Maguire. It was mm-hmm. in the wrestling scenes in the crowd. And I went to use the restroom, which is outside of the soundstage, like a, a restroom that, that was shared with the soundstage next door. Uh, next door was Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. So I stood at the urinal, and then all of a sudden there were two <laughs> giant gorillas in their full battle armor using mm-hmm. the urinal next to me. How did you sneak a peek? I Listen, I'm a gentleman. <laughs> so I would never tell you if I saw it or not. But I definitely, when I saw them in their flip phones making phone calls – that, that there you was go. You've arrived. Most, that was the most Hollywood. Um, I was like, oh, I'm finally in town. Mm-hmm. But all right. I'm going to tie it back yes. now. You ready? We, yeah. Tie it back. We just talked about an elephant. And of course, the elephant is descended from the woolly mammoth who got a lot of work as a dishwasher on oh, the yeah. Flintstones and then was largely extinct, super extinct uh, by the time the Jetsons appeared. And that is what we're going to discuss all today. Right. Yes. The, 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 also, we both love Garfield. Yes. Friends. The t- oh, of course. We okay. Now Garfield. we'll talk about. I got Jack Kirby questions, Great. but we're going to stay. Oh, we're right. going to, we're going to, we're going to, we got to stay on task yes. here. Harrison we- Wool has asked this question. Hi, Harrison. And we've been very patient waiting yeah. to know. <laughs> it's something people debate mm-hmm. is w- which is better, Flintstones uh, or the Jetsons. And they're, they're somewhat contemporaries. Of course, the mm-hmm. first, uh, primetime animated series was the Flintstones came out in 1960. And now, uh, we're just about a month away from the Jetsons celebrating their 55th anniversary. That's right. 62 they came out. Um, they're both sort of nuclear families and they're both based on really well known source material. So the Flintstones, of course, are based on the honeymooners. Mm-hmm. Now the, the Jetsons, I've seen two different things. One is make room for daddy. The other is Blondie. No, it's actually the life of Riley and Blondie put together. Okay. There you go. There we go. Officially canon That's answered. It. Yes. So, so you, you're the right age. To, to be a fan of both before you were working in animation. Before I was, yes, I was, I, I was 10. I mean, for these, when, when the Jetsons went on the air. Were you drawn more as a child to the Jetsons or the Flintstones? Cause you were a little bit too young for the Flintstones or you were, no, you're about no, the right I, age no, there I was, too. I was, I was nine when the Flintstones, the Flintstones went on in 1960. I was eight. Yes. I was eight. Okay. Uh, I loved the Flintstones when it came on. I liked the Jetsons better. Um, and I I can't really tell you why other than I think that by the time 
the, in the Jetsons came on, I'd had two seasons of the Flintstones, and those were long seasons. Those were like 30 episode seasons. Mm-hmm. And I thought the Flintstones was getting a little stale, a little okay. bit stale. And, and I, I really, I love the first three seasons of the Flintstones. I can't really watch a lot of the fourth or so on. It just, it started getting very repetitive to me mm-hmm. and very formula. Just dinosaurs saying, it's a living. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, but it was also, um, there's a, you know, it's like if you look, if you look at the honeymooners, mm-hmm. which was obviously you know a major source material there. What you've got there, if you think about it, is a guy a story about a guy who opens his big mouth and endangers his family income every week and lies to people and threatens to punch his wife out. It's a very yeah. intolerable situation, and the only reason the honeymoon I always thought the only reason the honeymooners worked well was because of Art Carney because he was such a lovable guy. If he was mm-hmm. Ralph Crabman's buddy, you figure Ralph can't be that bad. Right. In the case of the Flintstones, here's a guy, Fred, who's got a making a decent living at the rock quarry, and he's just you get frustrated. I get the same frustrated sometimes watching I Love Lucy episodes. Like, Lucy, why did you cause so much trouble for the people you ostensibly love this week? Why, you know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> oh, you've destroyed Rick, Ricky's career again by trying to get yourself on TV or something. Um, I just have a little low tolerance for shows that are, that are allowed, uh, kind of about, um, people who ostensibly love each other. Who do bad things to each other? Right. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think though the Flintstones, obviously based on the honeymooners, but coming out a little bit later, is in that post-war like yeah. it's all just about getting ahead. So they 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 certainly laid back off of. I, I don't remember Fred Flintstone ever threatening to wallop his wife. Yeah. No. No. no um, he, 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 that, that anger was more directed towards Barney than anybody yes, else. Where yeah. he would. I just I just got a little tired of the Flintstones. And then when the Jetsons came along, first of all, it was in color. Mm-hmm. I we had we had a black and white set at the time, but the Jetsons was the first series broadcast in color on ABC. And down the street from us, a couple of doors, was a little old lady named Mrs. Hollingsworth who had a color TV. And on Sundays, I would go down, and she'd let me watch the Jetsons in color. And, <laughs> and I sat there with my little drawing pad because I I wanted to learn how to draw all the Hanna Barbera characters, and I I drew them very well for age ten. Right. And I draw them exactly the same way now. <laughs> uh, After years of being side by I, side I draw, with I, Hannah and Barbera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 when I worked for the Hannah Barbera comic book division, I ran it. I would do, I occasionally would do artwork because I was the editor and nobody could stop me. But, <laughs> but I didn't draw them that well. Uh, so, uh, but I just thought the Jetsons was a fresher, funnier show. I liked the characters more. Um, I just, I, now, of course, the thing is, the Jetsons only was one season then, mm-hmm. so it didn't stick around long enough to get stale. The Flintstones, I got think, got tired very quickly. The Jetsons, had it not been canceled for one season, might have gotten stale right. just as fast. But that didn't happen for me. It is, I, it is kind of a tick in in the favor of the Jetsons. The, mm-hmm. the, Thinking that it was only one season, while what was it, six seasons that that the Flintstones yeah. ran, and they got to the point where they, yeah. I think it was sixty five, they introduced yeah. Harvey Corman as the Great Kazoo, so they mm-hmm. kind of expanded. It had there was much more world building in the Flintstones. You could probably name more right. characters, not counting like Rock Hud Rock or Ann Marg Rock or all the celebrities they brought right. in, but. The Jetsons has persevered over time. It, it's it's still syndicated. People still watched it. It came back yeah. in in what nineteen the late eighties eighty seven I think it's like that. I, I was actually going to be the first sto- uh, story editor of the New Jetsons. Uh, Mr. Barbera called me one day and said we're reviving the Jetsons. We're going to do at that point they were going to do twenty six new ones. I think it later expanded the number and. Uh, and I thought, oh my goodness, here's my chance to do the Jetsons. I just, I love that idea. And then they talked about how low the budget would be, including the budget for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I liked it a little less at that point. Yeah, there you go. And then they put me with a producer who was in house at that time who talked about modernizing the show. And I thought, how are you going to modernize a show set in the future? Yeah, what? Because <laughs> that's, that's another thing that I think the Jetsons has really going for it mm-hmm. is its vision of the future is cool. Is kind of a permanently cool vision of what the future looks like. It's that great 1950s, mm-hmm. 1960s, a lot of circle, like mm-hmm. almost a, like what it's was like the, the original Tomorrowland. Yes, if and, everything and, was still mid-century, yeah, if yeah. it was like a Thomas Kern yeah. design right. future. And, 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 and don't you just love movies 
that show you the futuristic world of the year 2002. Oh, I love it. Like that. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and you're going, wait a minute, I was promised flying cars. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was well, promised bu- buildings on stilts. Also, and- <laughs> they, there's a lot of futuristic stuff where it, it, I guess it's assumed that every building has been torn down. Mm-hmm. Where there, uh, no, I mean, we live in a time now where there are still castles all over Europe and the Empire State Building is still there and the Hollywood Bowl. You know what I mean? Wasn't everything, fl- the, I, there's everything almost flew. a sense of like there was a geostorm before the world of the Jetsons. <laughs> everything got wiped out. They're like, well, you know, frick it. We'll just build a whole city in the sky where everything floats and we'll yeah. use treadmills to get everywhere. Yeah. Was it, am I remembering that? No, I don't no, think no, everybody that's, that's... ever touched the earth on the Jetsons. Uh, once in a while, I think. But anyway, it just, I just thought it was a fresher show when, 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 when they wanted to bring it back. Um, I had these meetings. Ultimately, they wound up doing it fairly faithful mm-hmm. to the original because they decided they wanted to be able to integrate the original episodes seamlessly. And, and there actually are a few of the new ones that it's hard to tell whether they're new or old mm-hmm. because they did finally get George O'Hanlon, um, to do the voice. They, which is partly because I told them he was alive. They didn't know this. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> wow. uh, but, um, uh, Hanna Barbera was a great place to work as long as you remembered that at times you had to say no. And I got mm. pretty good at turning down shows that were really problematic. I was very fortunate. I, there are a couple of shows that I was offered. And I, I just said, this is going to be a disaster. Because there was always one show at any given time that was an absolute nightmare and it had producer of the week on it and they kept firing and revamping people and they were out, and it was behind schedule and Bill, you'd see Bill Hanna running through the halls screaming about how the show was, was not coming out well and I didn't want to be on one of those shows. Let me, let me ask you this. So when they, when they revived the, the Jetsons in, in 85, it had been off the air for 23 years in first run. Yeah. Why bring it back then? Had the syndication done so well that they were like, well, there's more to be made here? Cause that was really, Rosie the, the maid became more prominent in that series. And so the Jetsons, I remember, was a mix of the original run and, and these shows, but it just seems odd to think that that's the one that they would bring well, here, back. Well, here's your answer, which is that during the period I was at Hanna-Barbera, which was roughly, Seven, well, I was in the comic book division starting about 76, and then the cartoons and the TV shows I started doing about 1980, and then I was there in, through much of the 80s. Um, it was, uh, boss of the week. Joe and Bill were always there, but the studio kept being sold or transferred to different divisions. One week mm-hmm. it was Taft Broadcasting, one week it was, you know, another company had it for a while. I can't remember all the names. And they kept having different people. Uh, running the studio and everybody who came in had a new vision. And I suspect that, you know, next one guy comes in and says, Oh, we got to bring back Hong Kong Fu. And the next guy comes in and says, we've got to do bring back rough and ready. And they just, everybody, every idea was being thrown out there. Uh, they would do an awful lot of development. And, and most of the writers and artists in the division I was in sat around all day doing premises and com- concepts for new shows and they did everything there was probably a redevelopment of every old Hanna Barbera idea and some of them made the cut because somebody was willing to come in and, and buy the show in the case of the Jetsons uh, I think somebody um, in the merchandising division noticed how strong the merchandising still was and that was a driving force and then somebody said look it's rerun real well and we've got the, but it's considering we've only got the 26 shows or whatever the number was. And think if we had, you know, uh, 65 of them, uh, what it would be worth. And that seemed like a very good investment, uh, to, you know, if they, rather than do a new show, uh, try to get to 65, let's start with these 26 we've got or 28, whatever they were. And so, but every idea was, was there was a the guy I shared an office with a guy who was doing a doing a show called Augie Doggy Private Nose. It was Augie Doggy. Augie Doggy and Doggy Daddy. No, it was just Augie oh, Doggy Doggie. in a detective coat going around <laughs> doing like film noir stories. And you think why Augie? How does Augie Doggy connect with film noir detective stories? And and you went around and there was every single idea. Right. Uh, now you were talking earlier about Joe Barbera. Selling stuff. Yes. Okay. I'll tell you the story here, which, which, this sounds like something somebody made up, but it's, it's true. There was, um, Hanna Barbera at the time, uh, one of the key people in the history of Hanna Barbera was a man named Cy Fisher, 
who was an agent, and the Cy Fisher agency represented Hanna-Barbera. And the way Joe Barbera sold shows uh, frequently was that he and Cy would go together to a meeting at the network or, so, or some syndication company or whatever it was, and Joe would pitch. And Joe was a wonderful pitcher, and he had the ability to change pitches in midstream. If he was pitching you a Western, and say he's pitching you on for a Western show, and you're kind of scowling like this isn't something we want. Right. He, he would say, "Now, by West, he said, now this is a great old Western. Of course, what the big thing is that Western is only a small part of this. Actually, it's set in the Stone Age, and the show actually has dinosaurs. <laughs> he, and he would effortlessly, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't catch him segueing. It's like a good politician who you ask him about, you know, one thing, and he gets you to Bolivia or something. Yeah. So Joe would, and he, and he, and Cy would sit on the couch. I was in a couple of these meetings. And Joe would be entrancing everybody with how funny he was and cl- clever and charming. And Cy would be laughing hysterically at everything Joe said. And then when Joe, when Joe finished, I, they may have had a signal to this. I'm not sure. Cy would turn to the buyer and say, well, what do you think? And if the buyer said, this sounds good, Cy would go, look at his watch. Go, oh, my God, we got another meeting we got to get to. Okay, thanks. We'll close the deal tomorrow. Once you get the answer you want, get out of the room. Yep. Before they go. have a chance to reconsider. So Joe is in one day pitching idea A and it's not going over. So he turns it into idea A1 and then he turns pitches idea B and he pitches idea C and then he, he says, you know, we could link idea C and the A. A lot of Hanna Barbera shows, as you saw them on the air, were a case of Joe put two pitches together in the room. Do you have examples? Uh, Casper and the Space Angels. <laughs> Here's an idea called the Space Angels. Here's an idea called Casper. Let's do Casper and the Space Angels. What do they have to do with each other? I don't know. But Joe sold it. Um, there, a lot of them were like, that. let's make a movie let's, with the Flintstones and the Jetsons. Yeah. Let's, let's take, let's take, uh, let's take this character out of this show and put him in this show. They would do that all the time. They mix and match. Joe was um, brilliant at this. So. Well, that's pitched, why I feel like that yeah. became their, like, the Hanna Barbera collection of yeah. characters became a team, yeah. almost. Yeah, and eventually you do something like Laugh on Limits, which had like mm-hmm. n- most of the minute. Yeah. So Joe is pitching this one day, and finally the guy from the network says, "That's a, we love this idea. We we, we want to do this." And Sai says, "Oh, look at the time. Thank you. We'll be out." And he goes down the hall, and he Sai turns to Joe and says, "Congratulations, you sold another show." And Joe said, "Which one did they buy?" And Sai said, "I thought you knew." <laughs> and, and and Joe says, "You want to go back?" And no, no, we don't go back. We close the deal for the show. We, they sign the contract, and then we go back and find out what it is. So now they go off back to the office, and the next day, Cy gets a call from the network guy who says, "Listen, um, we're going to honor the commitment we made to you guys yesterday, but we're not sure which one we said yes to." So Joe Barbera had achieved something amazing. He'd actually sold nothing. He'd gotten a network commitment for nothing. <laughs> he didn't know, the agent didn't Nobody know, and the okay. network didn't know. So they know. made this deal, which essentially said, Hanna-Barbera will do two primetime specials for NBC <laughs> based on the concept of blank to be named later, essentially. Wow. And then they figured out, of all the ideas he talked about, which ones they were going to do, and that wound up being two primetime specials, which you will, everybody listening to this will remember vaguely, they were superhero roasts. They were live action oh, shows. Yeah. Oh yeah. One of them had Ed McMahon in it. Wow. And they were people dread. Adam West, I think, was in one. Yeah. Of them, and they had all these superhero roasts. Those came out of that. Wow. Uh, and that idea actually had been submitted to Hanna Barbera by Sheldon Moldoff, the guy who ghosted Batman for years for Bob Kane. He had met the people from Hanna Barbera. He'd written up some ideas, and <laughs> and Joe had sold. Shelly Moldoff's idea without realizing it was Shelly Moldoff's. Oh. And when Shelly pointed this out, they went, oh, we're sorry, Shelly. Yeah, and here's some money. Uh, <laughs> he not only sold nothing, he then took the commitment and used it on a show he didn't own. <laughs> oh, and, uh, but the, although they made good on it, everybody was happy. So that's what was one of the interesting things about Hanna-Barbera. And then what would happen, the next thing is they, when they sold the cartoon show, is you get a, I get a call – and Bill Hanna would say, we want you to start at this show, or Joe would call me. And I'd say, well, tell me about it. And they'd say, we don't know, we're not quite sure yet what it is exactly, but it'll be something like this. <laughs> and by the way, uh, it's already eight weeks late. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So Send me some pictures. Yeah. yeah. Oh and, uh, and I worked for Hanna-Barbera for a while until I finally 
I reached the stage where I couldn't argue with Joe Barbera anymore. I just felt mm-hmm. bad arguing because he was Joe Barbera. Right. It's hard to argue with a man whose name is on the building. And, and I liked him. I liked him tremendously, even though I knew he was, um, you know, he, he was producing a lot of shows that, that he, that he could have done better with. Uh, the, you had here two guys, Hannah and Barbera, who were depression era kids. And, and this is true of a lot of people. You, you mentioned Jack Kirby. This is true of Jack Kirby. Those of us who worked alongside those people of that generation sometimes didn't realize the importance of always working, of always having jobs for people. Right. Bill Hanna came into my office one night when I was doing Richie Rich, and he, Bill had had a couple of drinks, and he was uh, he was and Bill Hanna, you know, was a man who had more money than any, all of us in this room will ever see in our lives, and he was still working. He was the first one in the morning. He was the last one to leave at night. Um, he walked around the office in shirt sleeves, insisted everybody call him Bill. And he was, he was the kind of guy, he was like, I don't know if he was in his late seventies at that point. And if he saw someone carrying boxes down the hall, he'd pick up a box and, and help carry it. Right. Uh, he was, cause, yeah. cause it can always go away. Yeah. Cause you're, if you come if from you're that depression, depression yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, so, but, 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 to come but, from but, nothing. but yeah. I said to him this one night, I, it's one of those, I wish I had a tape recorder moments. Uh, I said, they had done something on Richie Rich that I didn't like. Uh, about moving the sh- uh, the animation was being done by a cheaper company, and it was ultimately a case of we've got to keep our people working. The alternative to doing what I thought they'd done, felt they'd done to the show, would have been to lay off a whole division, and these guys wouldn't have money. They wouldn't have you know they're, these these are people with families, and we can't we can't pay them for not working. So we're going to shift this show to that unit. Because they had the work that they originally had to do was delayed, so all of a sudden my show has got getting worse animation. But the alternative to that is that somebody's got to go to you know twenty people and say, wow. "We're sorry, you don't have a job now. You're fired. You're laid off." And that was a very big thing. One of the things Hannah and Barbera were both very proud of was how much work they gave how many people. And if you think of, I mean, uh, some of their shows. Obviously, we all can name shows we didn't like. Mm-hmm. And 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 what I'm about to say doesn't change the fact that those shows weren't wonderful. But you you do consider the fact that some of those shows put kids through college, paid for braces, mm-hmm. paid for medical expenses. Yeah. Um, and regardless of how you uh, how you know the audience at large may have thought of a show, yeah. there was an audience for yeah. all of them, and yeah. they made people happy. I meet people who think Hong Kong Fooey was the greatest cartoon ever done. He's number one super guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and it, it wasn't a show that. But I was the wrong age when it went on the air for that. I, I was, you know, I, it was a show I, I actually kind of liked a bit. You, 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 you sometimes have affection for these shows for mm-hmm. odd reasons. I was in the halls at Hanna Barbera, and Scatman Crothers, who was the voice of Hong Kong, yeah. was always in the halls singing and dancing and telling jokes. He was a, you couldn't dislike this man, you know, if he was in the Trump administration. And, <laughs> uh, and so I have a, a tough time hating Hong Kong Fooey because I love, Hearing that guy's voice, I just is affectionate. The same way Scrappy do. You, Scrappy was my friend Lenny Weinrib. Yeah, and I think yeah. of Lenny when I watch those episodes. And Lenny was a great guy. I loved Lenny, and he was just a funny man who did lovely things for people. And um, and he was and and what was wrong with that show was not his fault. Mm-hmm. He came in, he did his job very well. All those guys did. the The building was brimming with talented, great people, and and I would go to work there. At one point. They asked me to share my office with someone else, and I didn't really want to, but I said, oh, who, is, who am I going to get? And they said, oh, uh, this old guy's coming in to work for us. It was somebody who didn't, didn't really – it was like an office manager who didn't really know. Uh, his name is uh, Fred Avery. And I went, Tex Avery? <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, you know him? Some <laughs> office guy. You yeah, know him. Yeah, yeah. You know him. Yeah. Uh, um, did your head turn into a wolf I, and you started I, I, slapping I, the table as soon as you found I, out? My eyeballs went, you know. Ah, ooga. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, want to, you want to hear a Tex Avery story at Hanna-Barbera? Yes. Please. Yes. I was sharing this office with Tex. And I was only coming in like two or three days a week because at the same time I was re- serenting Richie Rich and some of these other stuff, I was working for Sid and Marty Croft full time. Or later I was working on That's Incredible full time. Mm-hmm. And I was also still writing four comic books a month. So I'd come in two days a week and they'd give me a really good office. And it was a great office because it was right in the center in the front. I should not have had this good an office. It was right in, in the front of every place. And if you came out of the recording studio, you had to pass my door. So – We'd be in there 
plotting against management, the writers and I would all be sitting there talking about, you know, how to how to let's get an elephant. That's right. Yes, that's right. We we didn't get an <laughs> elephant there. We got an undercover one at one point, but anyway. <laughs> so. Um, and Jonathan Winters would walk in. Oh, man. And he'd walk in looking for an audience. He was coming out of a Smurf station. Which one? Because were, weren't there 40 different versions of that and, guy? And I would say to him, <laughs> are you here to fix the plumbing? And he'd do 12 minutes on oh, the plumbing. <laughs> I love that. And I'm, and I'm sitting there interviewing Jonathan Winters, playing straight for Jonathan, giving him – Challenging him, trying to pin him. Amazing. Anyway, so that okay, is. So, so a, now Tex Avery and I are sharing this office, and and they come to me one day and they say, "We're moving Tex to another office. Um, Chuck Couch is coming to work here. Chuck Couch was an old Disney story man, mm-hmm. and this is the thing that Hanna and Barbera did. They gave jobs to these old animators, uh, who who otherwise nobody would employ because Disney didn't need Chuck Couch anymore. Right. So Chuck, rather than retire, he wanted to keep working. So. He called Hannah, and Hannah said, okay, we'll put you on staff. So they were going to move Chuck in with Tex, which made sense because they had their old buddies. And they were going to move him to this crummy office in the back. And uh, I thought, no, no, move me to the crummy office in the back. Keep them where they are. And I went around and said, don't. I come in two days a week. You don't need – I don't need the office that badly. So I was moved to the crummy office in the back. Fine. And I'd always be over in the office with Tex and Chuck with all the other young guys. We were, I was a young guy then, hearing about stories about the animation and things like that, the golden days of animation. It's Tex Avery, for God's sake. It's Chuck Couch who had, you know, could say, yeah, Walt told me one day, you know, it's. So I, I finished, I was finishing the season of Richie Rich and the office manager comes to me and says, Mark, we need your office. Can you be out by such and such a date? We need we need your office for somebody else. I said sure. I said, they said now make sure you take all your stuff home that that's yours because on this date we're bringing a new guy in who's going to take your office and and we can't have you leaving stuff there. I said I will be out of that office. Anything you want that's I leave in there just throw away. And they said fine because whatever it is we're going to throw it away. I said fine. So I finish the show. I take home everything I want. I leave a few boxes of junk there that I don't need and I go home and I went to New York for two weeks. While I was gone in New York, somebody, the office manager says to a flunky there, go make sure Evanier put everything out of his office. The guy goes, okay, he looks up in the phone directory, and he goes to the office that's now Tex and Chuck's because it's an old phone directory. It's got my oh, office. Oh, no. And he reports back to the office manager, there's tons of artwork and scripts and stories in there. You know, there's, there's a ton of stuff. And she, the office manager goes, oh, geez, listen. Box it up. Go get some credit boxes. Box it up and just take it to Evan, get, find Evanier's phone uh, address and take it to his house and dump it on his front steps. So they, this guy boxes up the to- the contents of Tex and Chuck's office one day after, after work and he takes it over and he leaves it on my front porch here. I don't know anything about this. The next morning, Tex Avery walks into his office, opens the door, goes in and does a Tex Avery take. <laughs> You know, oh, I would give money to know, see that. Yeah, you know, I, I imagine a little dro- little tiny Sergeant Droodle, Droopy there, and yeah. Tex goes, you know, does six. And then Chuck walks in a few minutes later and he says, what happened, Tex? And Tex says, I think we've been fired. And all day, people are running around <laughs> looking for Chuck and Tex. They've got scripts in the work. They're in the middle of stuff. And nobody can figure out where it is. The guy who did it was off that day. <laughs> Finally... Late in the day or something, the guy calls in and somebody says to him, do you know what happened to the stuff in Texas? And Chuck's off. They put it together. They figure it out. They send another guy over to my house to take the boxes off the step and take them back. I don't know anything about this at all. I'm in New York. Oh, my God. <laughs> they, so they take all the boxes back. So I get back a couple of days later. I don't know anything about this. And I get this call from Tex Avery. And he says, um, Mark um, – I've got a box of stuff for you. I've got a box of your stuff. It's a box of comic books from DC. DC used to send me all the comics. And I said, why is it at Hanna Barbera? They used to send those to my, my home. He says, I got them here. So I drive out to the studio the next day and there's an unopened box of comics from me from DC addressed to my home address. The guy had taken my mail. <laughs> when he went back to take, <laughs> he had taken my mail and they, and he actually, the mail, the, the the mailman had not put the mail in the box. He'd left it on top of the box. So Tex Avery has my phone bill. <laughs> and he's, oh, my God. And he has, and he has, <laughs> has all these, 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 you know, these letters from my cousin and stuff like that. You know what, though? I bet that kid didn't get fired. Hannah no. and Barbera weren't going to fire a no. guy for something like he, that. He worked hard. It's also a hilarious story. It's a, it's a great story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
things like that happened around the office. <laughs> all there was one of those stories every day. Well, and it was a fun place to be. I'll tell you what. Let's take a little office break, and uh, we're going to hear about some of the other great shows on the Max Fun Network. And when we come back, because I don't think I'm glad that we've uh, been hearing these stories, because I think this is a this is a quicker fight than. Yeah. And uh, some might believe it to be. Uh, but we'll get to that, to the Flintstones versus Jetsons, when we come back. Hi, everybody. I'm your oldest brother, Justin McElroy. I'm your middlest brother, Travis McElroy. And I'm your sweet baby brother, Griffin McElroy. Me and 3,000 of your closest friends just found your next podcast obsession. Yeah. Okay, but like, the second best podcast. Oh, f- just listen to my brother, my brother, and me on MaximumFun.org. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm Allegra Ringo. And I'm Renee Colbert. And we host a podcast called Can I Pet Your Dog? Renee, can I tell you about a dog I met this week? Uh, I wish that you would. In turn, though, can I tell you about a dog hero? May I tell you about a dog breed in a segment I like to call Mutt Minute? (laughs) I would love that. Could we maybe talk about some dog tech? Could we have some cool guests on, like Lin-Manuel Miranda, Nicole Byer, and Ann Wheaton? I mean... Yeah, absolutely. I'm in. You're on board. What do you say we uh, we do all of this and put it into a podcast? Yeah, okay. You think? All right. Uh, should we call it like I don't know? Can I pet your dog? Sure. All right. Uh, what do you What do you say we put it on every Tuesday on Maximum Fun or on iTunes? Sounds What's good that? to me. <laughs> Meeting's over. And we're back. All right. All right. All right. We got to get we got to get down to 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 business here. I want to push back a little bit on uh earlier I know you mentioned your affinity for the Jetsons. Yes. Um and I wonder because I going into this, I'm not going to lie, my first thought was, oh, it's the Flintstones. Right. Was the first thought that I had. And I wonder if you're shaking your head. I wonder if your do you think that your joy in the Jetsons might be a little bit biased based on the fact that you got to see it in color. It was the first thing you saw. It was, you were at a point where you had gotten tired of the, the, uh, the Flintstones because I feel like the Jetsons, while a wonderful show, was built on the back of the Flintstones. Well, everything at Hanna Barbera was built on the back of the show before. I That's, mean, you know, very fair. Right. Okay. Um, this is not a hill I would choose to die on. <laughs> uh, a phrase that has come up a lot on this show lately, which I think is great. <laughs> we need uh, to stay away from hills in I general. Know. I Why think. are we going to all these hills, you guys? I'll tell you one of the, one of the things, and, and yeah, the, yes, I guess I am biased. One of the other things I loved about the Jetsons, uh, I had a belief, and the Flintstones was kind of an exception to this, but not fully, that the quality of a Hanna-Barbera show in the early days was uh, in direct proportion to how much Dawes Butler was in it. Ah. Okay. I loved Dawes Butler. I loved him. I got to be a close friend of his later, and mm-hmm. I loved him as a person. But even before I ever met him, there was just something about any character voiced by him that attracted me. Uh, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Mr. Jinx, Quick Draw, Snooper, Blabber, Augie Doggy. He was all those characters. He was, he was an amazing actor with a voice that – uh, made up for the limited animation. Mm-hmm. The Hanna-Barbera characters were very fleshed out and real in a vocal sense. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the animation did not have a lot of personality or, 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 uh, wit to it mm-hmm. because these cartoons were being made for $11. But, um, Dawes was an integral part of the Jetsons, and I also just kind of had a crush on Judy Jetson from the minute Janet Waldo's voice came oh, out sure. of that mouth, and sure, and, and got to know Janet, and I got to direct, I got to direct these people. You know, this is the thing. I I directed Mel Blanc. Wow. I actually gave Holy Mel boy. Blanc a line reading on how, on What's Up Doc in a Bugs Bunny special thing we what? did. What? I actually had to tell him how to read, but, but. I can't imagine a situation where I'd have to go, oh, no, Mel Blanc, Bugs Bunny sounds like this. Yeah. I, mean, I, had, I had to get him to, deli- we were redubbing a clip, but I had to tell him to say it a little, a little slower. But, All but, right. but. For, was, for technical but, specifications, yes. I understand. Yeah. It was Mel Blanc and it was a Dawes Butler and I just, didn't quite have the same uh, love for the for any Hanna Barbera show that didn't have Dawes in it. Okay, I, I, although I did like Top Cat a lot. I, I Top Cat I liked a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, um, the Flintstones stuck struck me sometimes as a little talky, and 
uh, and I, I, I don't dislike the Flintstones in any way. Uh, I wrote the comic book for a while. They're great characters. Um, but if you, if you have to make this little com- needless comparison between the Flintstones and the Jetsons. <laughs> How dare would, you, Mark Evanier, refer would, to it as needless? I would, I yeah. would, I would vote for, I would vote for the Jetsons, you know, slightly over, over the, over the Flintstones. For, for the Dawes Butler factor. For Although he Butler, wasn't Dawes Butler, he was always the, he was whatever animal said, it's living. Wasn't that him? That was usually Mel. That no, was Mel. Mel. Oh, Mel would do that as yeah, well. Mel would he do was that Barney. Well. well, what happened, you know, when you did the shows, uh, and, and actually, uh, Dawes was Barney Rubble in a couple of episodes. In the also. pilot, yeah? No. Well, the pilot was, Dawes did both voices. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was essentially doing the same, uh, Gleason impression he did on the Honey Mousers cartoons for Warner Brothers. Um, but when they started doing, uh, the Flintstones, as with many Hanna-Barbera ca- shows, they would do the first episode and they decided the voices weren't right and replace them. The, the first pilot, uh, they did the pilot with Dawes and, and June Foray mm-hmm. on the Flintstones called Rest the Flintstones. And then when they recorded the first Flintstones episode, they had, uh, um, uh, was it Hal Smith and, uh, uh, Bill Thompson, I think, were doing Bar- Fred and Barney. Uh, uh, and they decided they weren't the right guys and they replaced them. Uh, and that happened Top Cat, a different guy was, was, was Top Cat in the original pilot, uh, first episode. They, they, um, uh, I, I like these shows, but in the case, of the, uh, so they would start with, they've got, uh, Alan Reed, uh, Mel Blanc, um, Gene Vanderpile and B. Bennett Derrett as your core cast. So they're mm-hmm. already in the re- recording session. Mel Blanc could double, triple, quadruple, could be four or five other guys. Right. But they didn't want to give him too many large parts because they didn't want to have Mel Blanc talking to Mel Blanc. Mm-hmm. So they would bring in a Don Messick, a Dawes Butler occasionally, Hal Smith, Howie Morris. There's about 20 guys, Doug Young, who would be supporting players in the in the Flintstones episodes, and those guys would double and triple. and And Don Messick was in an awful lot of them. Don right. Messick was maybe the most versatile voice guy who ever lived in terms of just having different numbers of voices, and and he was uh, uncanny with his ability to change voices. Don Messick could have a five part conversation with himself, and you wouldn't know it was one guy talking to himself. He, 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 could, he could switch faster than anybody who ever lived. He could overlap himself. He could interrupt himself. Uh, it was an amazing skill. Um, we, used but, to, we used to train to do that back in the mm-hmm. day of okay. Thrilling Adventure Hour. There's, there's about a hundred anecdotes about where somebody was directing a cartoon, and they said, hold on, we got to cut here. The guy in doing Pete is all is talking over the guy doing Sam, and Don Messick would go, I'm doing both those parts. <laughs> he, he, was overla- <laughs> he was overlapping himself. Uh, and uh, so the animals would be Mel – or if Don was in the cartoon, it might be Don do a couple of them or Dawes mm-hmm. or whoever. But most, the most part, you know, the, the, you know, the, the birds that, uh, Mel was really good at birds. You know, you, mm-hmm. he was, Mel made a, had a whole career doing parrots on sitcoms. Anytime was, <laughs> there was a parrot on a TV series for 20 years, it was Mel Blank, uh, <laughs> doing the parrot. You know, it's like, we got a parrot in the show, call Mel Blank. Uh, and so, so he did, he did almost all the birds. Uh, and he did, you know, he did Dino. Yeah. And he did, uh, except for the one episode where Dino spoke. Right. Um, that was, uh, Jerry Mann, another guy who was in a few mm-hmm. episodes. Uh, so you've got like, you've got your core actors and you've got your supporting players. And, uh, and I, I really like those. I like, I like the voices in them, but I just like the shows with, with the Jetsons cast a little better. Okay. I think they were just funnier. Well, you know what? I, this is, I kind of love this because I know that, Hal, you and I both, like you said before, we came in thinking, well, this is going to be the Flintstones. It's right. a, uh, a seminal show, but you and I are coming from out, an outside perspective strictly as viewers. So I love coming into this and getting, and getting a perspective from, no, 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 this is, this is from an insider. This one, I prefer this one and this one, uh, will, could very easily win at this moment because this is from the inside. This is what that show was. It was like to be 
there when it was happening. For sure, for sure. And I, you, we both have reverence for both shows. And mm-hmm. two of my favorite voiceover auditions of all time, one was for Spacely, the other was for <laughs> not Fred Flintstone in a, in a series, but Fred Flintstone for a commercial for the Columbus Zoo. <laughs> Wow. So it's just like, come down to the Columbus Zoo this weekend. Uh, we should, uh, we should drop our, our, because we both auditioned for, I believe, both Mr. Spacely yeah, and I auditioned which for is George. Just like, how many times you go, Jetson? Like, yeah. well, uh, but uh, here, here's what I think we should do. Mm-hmm. I think that rather than coming up with criteria and then comparing them, right. because, uh, Mark Evanier has take, you've taken a pro Jetson stance in a slight edge over the Flintstones, not saying anything bad about the Flintstones. I think this is more of a stress test where mm-hmm. you and I will try to figure out, is there an angle where the Flintstones actually do edge out the Jetsons? And are there enough of them for us to overall take a step back and say, the Flintstones are actually the best over the Jetsons for this reason? Does that, does that sound reasonable to both of you? That sounds great. Fine. <laughs> Mark's mad now. He's leaving. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, my only thing, uh, with the, I, the edge that I think that the Flintstones would have over the Jetsons is the, and I say it all the time, is the cultural impact of the Flintstones. Right. Um, it could be argued that it's the Jetsons being the first primetime color show for ABC was simply a matter of timing. Uh, the, 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 it, had it been available two years prior, I imagine that the Flintstones would have been well, yeah, well, broadcasting they, color. Yeah, they just, they, it was an advertiser driven thing, mm-hmm. I think, at that point. And, you know, and then, you know, a couple weeks later, everything was in color. Uh, but, you know, if you want to talk about which show was more important, yeah, the Flintstones was more important. Um, it established the fact that you could do a show in prime time, an original mm-hmm. show in prime time. Uh, and animation doesn't, you know, fit in prime time exactly because the 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 lead time required to do animation doesn't coincide with the lead time in a live action show. Mm-hmm. Right on a live, if you you know today, if you get an order for a sitcom and they order, they'll order eight episodes, and if they like those, they'll order another six, and then they'll order another. You can't do mm-hmm. a cartoon show that way because the, you have so much lead time necessary right. that you kind of have to commit. Seasons ahead. One of the reasons that The Simpsons worked at all was that Fox was willing to say, "Okay, we'll buy a whole season at a time and we'll air them regardless." When The Simpsons was a hit, a lot of shows were tried that didn't have the advantage of being able to do five episodes um, ahead and ten more ahead and things like that. Right. Um, I remember a couple times when they were doing all these prime time shows. I'd get a called in and they'd say. We've got the first three episodes. They they stink. We don't know what to do about them. And I'd say, <laughs> you can't fix them. They're, yeah. they're not fixable because because you know on uh, it, when they're doing a live action sitcom, they can go down to the set and watch the rehearsals, or they can watch that and they can say, hey, you know that Fonzie character is is really good. Let's feature him more in next week's episode. But on a cartoon show, by the time you see episode one, episode nineteen is done. Mm-hmm. And you can't, and it's, it's like a train wreck. It's coming in no matter what. Um, there was a period in my life when they would call me in on Saturday morning shows and they'd say, the show's been in production. We're doing 13 of them. We're up, you know, and, and we, it's not working. Can you come in and story edit and rewrite and such? And I'd say, well, how many are already done? They'd say nine. And I'd say, it's over. You can't, <laughs> no, there's, there has never been a cartoon show that got better during its first season. Right. Ever. Yeah. You can't name me a single show where it was lousy and then suddenly episode nine, it became terrific. They're all, huh. they're all pretty much the same because the people writing the first eight. Right. Never saw a finished episode. By the time nine came through, they've already got 10, 11, 12, and 13 written. Mm-hmm. And, um, n- nobody can have a vision to course correct the way, you know, you, you see primetime shows like in you know, the odd couple, they started doing them and they changed. They got rid of the poker guys after about eight, eight six episodes. Mm-hmm. They went to doing the show in front of a live audience eventually. They kept fiddling with the show and changing it. You can't fiddle with a cartoon show. Mm-hmm. You can't even edit it differently because when you are editing a primetime live action show, you have, you know, a bunch of different cameras. You've got camera angles. You've got lots of footage and you can cut away and do things with, if you have a, you know, a 22 minute and cartoon, you've got 22 minutes of animation. There's no way to cut away yeah. to anything, really. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned the uh, having the audience. The Flintstones, when it first aired, did it have... It was a laugh track. Yeah. The laugh track was yeah. in it. Was yes. that done? Was that 
simply sound effects dropped in or was yeah, it we no, showed this no, to an no, audience? No, no, there was sound effects dropped in. Mm-hmm. The, the premise of the Flintstones, people forget this, is that it was supposed to be a cartoon for adults. Mm-hmm. It did not air at 7.30 in the evening like kids shows did. It was, I think, at 8.30 and then when they moved to 9 at one point. Such a, you know, before it, I think there was uh, The Hathaways with Jack Weston and that mm-hmm. was a show for kids. It was about mm-hmm. a family of monkeys. Uh, but the Flintstones was supposed to appeal to an older audience and its sponsors were not toy companies. Its sponsors were cigarette, uh, cigarette right. company. Right. And, 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 uh, um, one a day brand vitamins, things that kids don't say. I want to go, mommy, buy me that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, aren't oh, I used to say that to my parents. Cigarette commercials out there. There are Flintstones cigarette commercials. Yeah, you go to YouTube and, 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 and you can find Fred and Barney smoking. Please Ironically, right I now, wanted, please. uh, Flintstone, uh, I wanted Flintstone vitamins as a kid. And now as an adult, I want Flintstone cigarettes. Well, you did crush them up and snort them. <laughs> I'm just going to do a quick bump of uh, Bam Bam before I go into school. Oh, man. Jo- Hashtag bump of Bam Bam. Jo- George Carlin used to, when he toured, he would have Flintstone vitamins mm-hmm. because otherwise they would, you know, the, the people at the airport would search his, 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 uh, luggage and find pills and they'd go, what are these? Well, if they were in the shape of Barney, it was a little easier. Yeah. Be, you know. <laughs> so, um, but the Flintstones went from being a show that was supposed to be a, a, a prime time situation comedy that just happened to be animated. Mm-hmm. And they, they originally sold it that way. Um, and over the years, it just went for a younger well, sure, audience. They started a younger audience and, advertising with them as, you know, for yeah, Fruity Pebbles uh, well, and, you know, they, they started and they, you know, and they went to, it was Welch's mm-hmm. grape juice and, yep. and was, it was eventually the sponsor. And so it was a, it, 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 and then it ended up on Saturday morning and it became a, a, uh, a show for kids, mm-hmm. which it kind of always was in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to – what one area where the Flintstones definitely holds an edge is in their merchandising. And that comes from how many years they were on the air. But you've mm-hmm. got the vitamins. You've got Fruity Pebbles. I, I would assume – uh, in the seventies when they had the Pebbles and Bam Bam show where they had a band that they at least tried to release singles if oh, they yeah, didn't yeah. release singles. Hanna so Barbera Records had, would put out, put out bar, Pebbles. Yeah, there was a period where every, every show on Saturday morning had to have a band. I, I remember as a kid, well, yeah, everybody. After the Archies, <laughs> right. Yeah, the Archies were the, the yeah. progenitors of the, the teen band. But, uh, I remember as a kid, I did not have the Jetsons version of this, but I had the story, the Flintstone storybooks that came with a cassette. And the cassette would tell you when to turn the page, and yeah. it was like Fred skins his knee. It was a, a a smaller story, but that I was inundated with that. Flintstones was everywhere, mm-hmm. not and yet, despite that, in my mind, the Flintstones and the Jetsons are. Are equal shows, so the, yeah. the merchandise does come out of it. The the, for, the more I think about it, not not that I, it's still hard to pick the Jetsons over the Flintstones as the best. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it continues to persist and it persisted beyond uh, the movie that came out in 1990, which I went and saw in the theater, the with, Jetsons movie, yes, with uh, Tiffany, where they recast Judy. Yeah. Uh, as Tiffany because they wanted kids to come see sure. her. I'll, I'll tell you what happened with that. Cause it was, yeah, this, please. I, I still run to people who are furious about that. Um, Janet Wall, that, that, the, the Jetsons movie, first of all, interestingly came about, you may remember that, um, uh, Hannah Barber did a bunch of, of TV movies, uh, including a Jetsons meet the Flintstones one, and mm-hmm. he did a right. good, bad, and Huckleberry Hound, and a few others. Mm-hmm. It was a Top Cat one of things. The Jetsons movie was written as one of those low budget TV movies. A fellow named Dennis Marks, lovely guy who's passed away, wrote this thing, and uh, somebody at that point at Hanna Barbera said, "Hey, wait a minute, maybe we could use this as the basis for a feature." And Dennis, who was dying, he was furious that he wrote the thing for no money for right. the, so the cheap oh, TV wow. movie, and they made a big feature out of it. They got Universal interested in doing it, and uh, they recorded the track with Janet Waldo doing the full voice. And somebody at Universal said, we want Tiffany to do the songs in it. And Joe Barbera and Bill Hanna had no problem with that because – and this is something I never quite understood, and I actually had arguments with them. I, I, I argued with Bill and Joe a lot. It's one of the reasons I finally left the place. I was, I was arguing too much with the guys whose names were on the building. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I thought it was awful when I went to say, hey, there's Yogi Bear, and Yogi didn't, when, had a different voice when he sang. 
different guy did it and yeah. such. And they did that on a lot on their things. Henry Corden started off as Fred Flintstone being the singing voice for Alan Reed. Right. Because they didn't like the way Alan Reed sang. I much preferred Alan Reed. Because he wasn't a like singer. Henry Corden was a yeah, singer. Yeah. Well, more of a, a, a little better than him. But the point was, it was really, if the character changes voice, then all of a sudden you become conscious that it's not really the character. Um, so, um, they were fine with Tiffany doing the singing then. And at some point, the story was that Tiffany's manager says she won't do it unless she also is is Judy because they want to prove she's an actress. Okay. I don't know how doing the voice of Judy Jetson prove you're an actress. Sure. <laughs> but Universal <laughs> said uh, either we – Tiffany does the voice of Judy or we don't make the movie. So – and I heard Mr. Berber tell this story two or three times – he had the, you know, people were angry at him. The people, he would, people yelled at him over this and got very upset with him. How could you do that to Janet Waldo? How could you do that to Judy Jetson? And he essentially said it was either that or no movie. Right. And that's a, a, and, and, you know, in show business, we make those compromises occasionally. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it works out okay. And I imagine to those guys, it was one job or 150 yeah. jobs. And, right. and then if you want to, now if you want to get, you know, too deep into the weeds on this, that movie was the last thing that um, Mel Blanc and George O'Hanlon did. George O'Hanlon had been retired. George O'Hanlon got to star in a major motion picture before he died, and he got to leave his widow the money from that movie, and he got a big, a lovely farewell. I yeah. mean, you know, if Joe Barbera had said, no, we're not going to give in to this de- Tiffany's agent's demands – and the movie didn't happen, think of all the people who wouldn't have gotten work, including George O'Hanlon would have been dead by the time they made that Jetsons movie. It's a greater good. And somebody else would have. So somebody else would have been George Jetson if they'd made it two years later. All right. So, I mean, you can – anyway. So Don Messick, who we all know who Don Messick was, Don Messick, shortly – about six months before he died, he had a stroke. He had a terrible stroke, and he was in a recording session. And he retired. He actually went home from this recording session and – had his agent call Hanna Barbera the next day and say, Don will never work again. Recast his roles. Find somebody else to play Scooby Doo and such. And they had a party. I was invited to this. This is one of the, those wonderful moments when I can't believe that I grew up watching Hanna Barbera cartoons and now I'm at this moment of <laughs> Hanna Barbera history. I was at Don Messick's retirement party and everybody who had ever done voices on, who was available, you know, I looked over and there's, there's, um, um, uh, Casey Kasem, and there's Frank Welker, and there's, uh, uh, Janet Waldo, and there's all the, anybody they could get who'd ever worked with Don was there. And they had, it was a, at this, it was at this Chinese restaurant, and Casey Kasem agreed to come only if they would let him pick the menu. <laughs> because Casey was a militant vegan. Wow. And all of a sudden we all got these when they started bringing out the food, there's no meat there. <laughs> and and some of us were like and he brought out his top 40 dishes right. and none of yeah. them had meat in yes, them. Yes. And and he dedicated them all to a, to a teenager in Kansas City. So you know, some of us were actually like, you know, going to the waiter saying, can you slip me some chicken chow mein for yeah. God's sake? Anyway, so Joe Barbera gets up at this um and Don Messick is there. He he could not talk. He could make the Scooby grunts, and he and he and he would do that. He would actually, if you went up to, we all went up to Don and we said, Don, we love you. We were so sad that you're not going to work anymore. You were a great guy, and we would hear back in the grunts of Scooby, not even words, just just the Scooby sounds wow. that indicated yes and no and thank you and things like that. And it was, it was like we, we, people were joyous and tearful at the same time. Yeah. Joe Barbera got up and he took – he said, I want to take this opportunity while well, we got the whole voice community here to apologize to Janet Waldo. And he told the story of why they replaced her on the – and Janet got up and made this sweet speech forgiving him. And to this day, when I meet people and say, oh, I'm so mad at Joe Barbera for replacing the voice of Judy, I say, hey, Janet Waldo forgave him. You can forgive him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very touching moment because – and this is one of the reasons people love Joe Barbera. He ever so often would say to you, I screwed up. I made a mistake. And he didn't say he made a mistake this time. He said, here's why I did it. Maybe it was a mistake, but we, we would, we would not have gotten the movie made if we hadn't made that compromise. And, and none of us are in a position to say that's not so. Right. Um, I felt that when I was at Hanna Barbera, that there were an awful lot of those compromises made. And, 
and it wasn't that Joe and Bill were hungry for money. They had sold the studio, and they were and their their goal was to keep the studio, the new owners, from laying people off to keep the studio open and to keep product going in. And you know, this, doing Saturday morning shows was very seasonal. You'd finish, you'd start making the show in February or March, and then by by you know October they're laying people off. And suddenly a guy who's got a steady income has no work for four months. And they right, always yeah. keep trying to find a show to give, to keep the studio open and keep it functioning. And some of their worst shows were done on that basis. Um, uh, there was one show that, that everybody there hated, but you know, you, you say to the guy, how can you work on that show? And he says, my, my alternative is unemployment. I, that, I can't get on another, I can't get <laughs> yeah, on another, yeah. I can't get another animation job for four months. I'll work on this show. And my kids will have braces. So, I mean, you, you can discount that. They don't even need as, them. It's as, a job. Yeah. I just want to get yeah. my kids some yeah. braces. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, Dad, yeah, I you don't know. need braces. And, and, and every so often one of those shows done for the wrong reasons turned out pretty good. Yeah. So that, that, that happened too. So anyway, that was the, the, the Don Messick's retirement party. I think he died about a month later. But wow. it was a beautiful. But he went out with a blast. It was a beautiful evening of love and affection for this man who was essentially a spear carrier. I mean, Don was rarely the star of a show with actual dialogue. He was star mm-hmm. of Scooby, but obviously, you know, Scooby wasn't a, 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 Scooby was a sound effects job mostly for the most part. And it was a brilliant characterization. There's no kid alive who ever watched that show who didn't try to make Scooby sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and my God, the character has endured like nothing else that we've ever seen that came out. It's probably the most popular thing that ever came out of Hanna-Barbera. And that was Don. But, you know, Don was usually guy number five. He was the supporting guy. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, you know, Dawes was Yogi. Don was Boo Boo and the Ranger, you know, and he was great at what he did. And I, I worked with Don a few times and I just, I couldn't get over the fact that it's Don Messick in the booth and, you know, just as it was Dawes Butler in the booth. And, and, you know, uh, you know, we're doing this, uh, right after June Foray passed away. I couldn't believe that I, was working with June Foray and directing June Foray and writing stuff for June Foray and knowing June Foray because I remember being a kid watching those cartoons and listening to Stan Freeberg records. I was so proud when I figured out that the lady on the Stan Freeberg records was the same person who was doing Rocky, the Flying Squirrel. I did not know that June Foray did the Stan Freeberg records. She was on most of his records, yeah. Yeah. She was, she was on, uh, right behind you, there's a, an autographed copy of United States of America that Freeberg gave me. Yeah. And she's on, she's the lady at the end who <laughs> yells about being from the daughters of the American Revolution. I did not That's know that. Wow. I and, heard tell of a, a Broadway musical version of this. There was uh, going to be one, yes. And it, it no. never happened. And Freeberg's autobiography tells the long, sordid story of that. Oh, wow. And I, I, I helped, st- uh, I'll tell you one of those looking glass moment things. This is, we're way, way off the top of the theater. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I discovered Stan Freeberg records and I loved them. I discovered them because Soupy Sales used to have Pookie and Hippie mime to them. And I love those, re- I figured out they were records and my father said, I think that's Stan Freeberg. So I went to a record shop, it was on Westwood Boulevard in West LA, a big record shop, and I walked in and I said, I'm looking for Stan Freeberg. I was like 10 or 11. And they said, uh, comedy records, aisle four, whatever it was. I went over and I found a, a bin of Stan Freeberg records. And I recognized some of the titles from Bit Soupy had done. So I bought a record called Face the Funnies because it had cartoon characters in the front of it. And I took it home and they had credits on it. And there was the credits for Dawes Butler and June Foray. And I suddenly had like the Rosetta Stone to figure out, oh, that's what Dawes <laughs> Butler said. That must be Huckleberry Hound because he sounds like Huckleberry Hound. And I figured out I had all of a sudden had names to go with these voices that were in my head. I went back the next week and I bought volume one of United States of America. It was a whole series and it pledged on it that there's going to be volume two and three and four. Mm-hmm. So I went back the next week and I said, is volume two in yet? And they go, no. I went back the next week, is volume two in yet? No. Volume two yet? It went on and on. It didn't come out. It didn't come out. Little realizing that I would have to wait 34 years <laughs> and co-produce the record with Stan to get volume two. You co-produced but, the record. But there's more to that. Stan called me one day and said, can you meet me for lunch at Junior's Delicatessen? I want to talk to you about a project. And I went to Junior's Delicatessen, which was over, you know, in West LA. And I, he, we sat there and he told me, I'm going to do, finally do volume two. Rhino Records is going to fund it and I need some help. Could you help me cast the voice? Cause he had to, re- he had written it for, you know, Paul Fries, who was dead and for, mm-hmm. for all these people. And I, I'm the one who found 
Corey Burton to do the Paul Free sound alike. I knew Corey. And I helped cast the thing and I rewrote a few lines. There's about eight lines in the United States of America Volume 2 that I wrote. And I was at the recording session. I couldn't believe I was at the recording session of Volume 2 after 34 years. But here's the amazing thing. Junior's Delicatessen, I swear to you this is true, was built on the site of that record shop. Wow. They tore the record shop down and built Junior's Delicatessen. <laughs> I was in, uh, sitting there in Junior's Delicatessen on the exact same piece of real estate where I bought United States of America Volume 1. Unbelievable. And here's another one of those connections, weird one connections. Um, the very first time I ever saw my name in print was a letter I had published in Aquaman. You know, I, I, I had a, I wrote uh. letters into the editors in comics <clears throat> and I bought, and I, and a man named George Cashton was the editor of Aquaman. And he picked my letter and printed it. And it, it was one of those life changing moments. I didn't get a nickel for it. It didn't, it, was, it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to be a professional writer. I got a letter yeah. on Aquaman. But you're like, I, look, my name I should stood be in there. Book. I stood there in the drugstore saying, I'm in a comic book. My name is in a comic book. Something I wrote is in a comic book. And that was kind of a life changing moment for me. And George Cashton was a guy in New York who worked for DC Comics 3,000 miles away. The last couple of years of his life, George Cashton was in a rest home in Los Angeles across the street from where I bought that comic book next door to the record shop wow. where I bought the They later of became Juniors. Oh that's right. Yeah. Somebody put a plaque on that block yeah. immediately. Yeah. That's pretty And amazing. now Juniors is the – it's still there. Uh, the restaurant's closed, it, but it, it is it's not a big sign that says available for filming, right? No, it's, no, no. It's, 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 it's now called Lenny's Delicatessen. Yeah. Lenny's I just now. drove past it. It's, oh, it's, it's now yeah, – yeah, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. reopened. Yeah. 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 yeah, Juniors closed and it became Lenny's. And it's better now. It's a great deli. And uh, um, that was also, if, if anybody cares about this, that's also where Conan O'Brien recruited his writers. He would have to, he had a little de- table table no there <laughs> when he started out, and he, that's where he met Andy Richter in, in Junior Style Contestant. Wow. <coughs> well, anyway. well, there you go. All right, this is this is what it's all led to. We're gonna we're, let's make a decision here. All right. How do you want oh, to do yeah, this, we have Mark? To, I forgot. We're, what are we talking about? Flintstones and Jetsons. Flintstones and Jetsons. I don't, this is, uh, this is like, uh, yeah, this is like our Muppets episode where it's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we just want to hear matter. stories. Yeah. We, we, we've <laughs> gotten some amazing stories. It's time to make our decision. It's okay. It's time now. Mark, how do you want to do it? I'm going to uh, throw it on wow. your lap. Throw it at me. Yeah. Um, I think that we've, we've, discussed each of them in depth i think we've got some great stories about the jetsons we've got some great stories about the flintstones Mm -hmm. obviously you have a very personal connection to the jetsons um i think that uh culturally the as we've all said the cult that culturally the um the flintstones have had much more of an impact um that I think could be counterweighted on the other side of this scale with the great personal stories about the Jetsons that we have heard. So with all things being equal, I will defer to our guest, Mark Evanier. So will I. So this is, this is a so, big question. So you're putting this on me. We are yeah. putting this a hundred percent on you. However, as a way to say thank you for Amazing stories. Yes. This and is, this is how, this is how the Trump administration deals with problems. They, they pick somebody yeah. and oh, they dump it on him. You're also yeah, you the are, new director of communications. Oh, <laughs> you oh, are our new Scaramucci. Oh, I, uh, Please call the New Yorker, yeah. but do it in a voice. Now to, to be fair, whatever you say, we are going to adhere to and we have your back a hundred percent. Okay. Also, but w- this is the struggle that we have uh, is there are often times where we come to a decision and we have to pull ourselves out of it and say, my favorite may not be the best. Uh, and our mm-hmm. classic example is Bill Murray being our favorite of the Ghostbusters because anybody our age who, who, who is in comedy idolizes oh, Bill their, Murray. Their whole However, thing to Bill when Murray. you look at who is the best Ghostbuster, it's clearly Egon Spegler. It's clearly Harold Ramis. So we had to separate the two. If you choose not to do that, we have your back. If you choose to do that or come up with can, something can different, I, it's okay. Can, can I can I weasel out of this by saying that I think the the Flintstones was more important historically to animation and to television and to Hanna Barbera, but I have more personal affection for the Jetsons. You can say that, but are, but are we saying that the decision for this episode would be the Flintstones? Uh, I would say that. It's, it, it, ask me the exact question. This is literally the exact question in its entirety. Flintstones or Jetsons? Well, I mean, it was, it, 
which oh, one, which one comes which one comes first in alphabetical order? Is that the question? Mark, we <laughs> we did an episode where we compared apples and oranges and had to pick one. There's nothing outside well, who, our who, purview. Who, who won? Apples. Apples. Clear, right? Yeah, no, obviously. Total sense. No, no, okay. We got we got to relitigate that one. <laughs> oh. uh, Should have uh, known that you were going to be trouble. Should have known. Um, um, if the answer is, I would say the Flintstones is more important. I say it's more historical. So, and I would, and when you when you pick the two things, I would say that probably, um, oh, why am I doing this? Um, I will say Jetsons. All right. Because I'm just, because I'm going to interpret the question as which one did you like better? I love that. Okay. And, and now I really want to go watch this Jetsons movie with Tiffany's voice in it. Yeah. No, uh, I want, no, I, no, I, no, no, I, no, no, you don't. No, all right. you, no, I, no, I do want, don't. I do want to go and, and watch some, uh, some classic Jetsons now and knowing these stories about all these amazing people that yes. made this. Um, so how, if you will? Yeah, allow me to wrap this up and say, people of the world, this was never about the decision. This no. was about trapping Mark Evanier in his home <laughs> and taking the bag off of his head and having him tell incredible stories about the history of animation. <sighs> if you like the Flintstones, like the Flintstones. Yeah. If you like the Jetsons, like the Jetsons. The Jetsons won, so now for all time, binding legally and non-legally across all known media and unknown in the universe in and beyond. In perpetuity. The Jetsons are better than the Flintstones. You can rap about pebbles all you want. You can be a million strong and growing. It's fine. Yeah. The Jetsons win because they have a robot made. How cool is that? Rosie was only in two episodes of the first season, if I'm not mistaken. And then oh, she, she rose in, the she prominence in the 80s. She was, she was around in the background, is what I'm saying. Oh, all right. Now, you know where she is? She's in Chile. She ran off. <laughs> but the point is <laughs> these two classic series on its on its 55th birthday, the answer is wow. – the Jetsons asked and answered. The if you future don't like is it, better than the past. Get on a get on a moving walkway and then realize that you live in the world of the Jetsons. You do not live in the Stone Age. Asked and answered. Thank you, Harrison, for your suggestion. But Mark Evanier, thank you for inviting us into your home and for talking tunes with us. Can I change my answer to Quick Draw McGraw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can know. You can change it to El Cabong. How's that? Oh, yeah, sure. there you go. Fine. Good. <laughs> so uh, tell everybody where they can find you. Is there anything particular you want to plug? Or I have a website. I have a blog. www.newsfromme. M-E is me, mm-hmm. my initials. And everything I do is mentioned there eventually. Don't, don't go to the site if you like Donald Trump. You won't, won't, won't like me anymore. <laughs> but there are some but, wonderful but, stories on that website. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I am, I am approaching 25,000 posts. Wow. Uh, Mazel and, tov. and, uh, so, you know, if you read back, they're all up there and this, and you, you have to find something there you like. See, what, ha- what it is, is I'm really good at things that pay no money. Oh yeah, so, uh, are we. so are we. We're yeah. really good at it. Yeah. We're podcasters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people ask me, you know, uh, can you do this? And I say, does it pay? And they say no. And I said, oh, I can do it. That's fine. Oh, no, that sounds yeah. great. <laughs> Con- convention panels and blogging and podcasts and things like that. I'm really, uh, I, I, I'm not good at anything that that has a paycheck attached to it. That's so, the problem. So the answer is, you can find Mark Evanier anywhere where people yes. work for free, or at his website. That's right. Newsfromme.com. This is, Make sure this, there are two M's. Yeah, that's right. This is th- this is the longest I've ever talked. Not about Jack Kirby, I think, in my life. I know. And you are forbidden con- yeah. contractually uh, for the Maximum Fun Network. We have to do a separate Jack Kirby episode. Believe me, his name is on our list. But this topic, Flintstones versus Jetsons, is settled. There's so many more out there. And we want to hear from you. What are the things that you want us? Take your flame wars and bring them to us and we'll douse them once and for all. You can reach us by email at wegotthispodcast at gmail.com. Or you can join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash wegotthispodcast. Podcast. Or reach out to us on Twitter at We Got This Tweets, or check out the Maximum Fun subreddit for the flame war that Hal just mentioned. Thanks, as always, to our musicians Jonathan Dinerstein and Mike Furman for our score and theme song, respectively. Thank you to producer Ken Plume, who is in the room right now. Can you give us a couple claps so that we know you're here? In this, you you know we require applause from Ken Plume. Yeah. I can't talk. No, no. we're, yeah. we're going to edit that out. Do you remember him from the end of Laughing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was so great. Yes. Uh, but thank you to Ken Plume for, for, uh, producing our show as always. Thanks to, to researcher Kate McManus who did a little rush job for us on this episode. Mm-hmm. Thank you to graphic designer Uri Kelman and QA engineer Jen Alba. And thank you, of course, to you, our listeners. 
you guys. We got to sit in a room with Mark Evanier and hear uh, amazing cartoon stories. Thanks to you guys. Uh, so w- thank you for listening to the show. Thanks for continuing to listen to the show and for supporting us. Uh, for Hal Lublin, I'm Mark Gagliardi. And for Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin. And don't worry, everybody. We, we got, got this. this. We got this. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported.